Okay, so uh, first and foremost, I am going to um, just share a, a, rep a GitHub repo that uh, you guys can use to uh, download today's material, lecture material, if you don't uh, already have it. So you could download it from here. Uh, there's also going to be some uh, prerequisite uh, installation that uh, you'll want to run through if you have not uh, used NLTK for the first time. Uh, I'll show you how to do it directly in Jupyter Notebook. Uh, speaking of Jupyter Notebook, that's what we're going to be using for today's uh, session. So Terrence, can you just pop a poll uh, to ask how, uh, so this way I could get a snapshot of how many folks have Jupyter Notebook installed. And uh, let's just uh, take about... Um, 30 seconds or so for uh, folks to vote. Uh, and just let me know when the vote's uh, coming on in. And this is uh, going to be the GitHub link that you see um, for that I've made with uh, for this specific uh, topic. So you could simply just do not uh, just basically download everything from there. Okay. All right, uh, it looks like we actually have a good amount of you who have Jupyter Notebook uh, or a Jupyter Notebook installed. Uh, for those of you who are curious, um, Jupyter Notebook is essentially, you can get it through uh, the Anaconda distribution. Uh, it comes, uh, it has, uh, there's a variety of different um, programming languages you can use with it. The most pop, one of the most popular is going to be Python. And uh, what's great about it is it's essentially just a um, interactive, uh, I, you can think of it as an interactive design interface for you to practice your coding and get, also get immediate results uh, live. It also gives every, creates everything as a markdown format. So as a result, it becomes very easy to kind of easy, quickly test your code, but also get general visualizations, walk through uh, in terms of just kind of like a uh, lecture so style or teach programming in some aspects. Uh, so hence why it is generally the preferred medium uh, for a lot of things. So if you don't have it installed in the future, you can just kind of go here, uh, this is actually my Anaconda dashboard. So you can simply just go to anaconda.org. You could go to just download Anaconda from there on. Uh, and you could go, actually, let me even make it a little bit simpler. Let me just go to Anaconda Python. Okay, there we go. So uh, you can grab it. Uh, let's see, where would it be? You could basically just ha have any of these installations and you could go uh, if you, depending on your OS and this will give you the relevant uh, Python pack, uh, Python uh, version that is uh, current in uh, Anaconda. And the benefit also of uh, getting it through uh, Anaconda distribution is the fact that there's going to be a fair amount of libraries that are commonly used in data science that are completely compiled uh, those of you who have already installed it and played around with it, chances are you already know some of them, pandas, numpy, respectively speaking. And you're going to see like some, most of them are actually already here, the ones that I'm importing here. So numpy, pandas, JSON, matplotlib, uh, requests. Requests might not be uh, natively built into um, Jupyter Notebook, but I think it actually already comes with uh, Python 3.8 anyway. So base Python should already have it. The only one um, that you may not have is NLTK. But basically, if you run this and you get an error of some sort that says library not found of that name, you can just run a line here. Google Colab also works. Yes, and Google Colab will all, uh, likely have a lot of, uh, a lot of the requisite uh, tools you need. And yeah, so the webinar is uh, text mining with Python. But it's actually, I would argue, it's not necessarily text mining just using uh, with the with Python itself. Uh, I actually would like to talk more about how, um, when dealing with text data, that often there's a lot of low hanging fruit that is missing in analysis that I tend to see from our students who are working with uh, text for the first time. What ends up happening is they kind of jump ahead to uh, some of the more advanced topics. For example, they might end up doing something like topic modeling. They might do some sort of predictive task and without the underlining analysis to uh, inform them of what to do. So as a result, I'd like to focus the discussion more on the analysis itself, but I will talk about how to use Python, certain Python tools to perform that analysis. And uh, most of it you can actually do in st using string operations. But if you want to use, uh, if you're familiar with R, then um, I recommend you could look at things like Snowball, you could look at TMP, those are just some, uh, some common R packages that um, I have used in the past when dealing with text data. That being said, I will say that um, uh, I'm actually, 
I'm actually uh, fluent in both R and Python. I, I actually like using both languages, uh, both from my statistical background, I'll, I have some biases towards R already, but also from in terms of general programming and uh, your engineering task and your day-to-day -day task in collaboration with others, Python has some advantages. Um, I will say that um, from my experience, Python has, if you're looking to deal work with text data, Python has a lot more readily accessible, easy to use tools than R does. Whereas if I am dealing with certain other tasks, such as maybe time series, for example, I actually tend to prefer R. Similarly, if I want to actually uh, get some sort of, do some, perform some sort of statistical test, statistical analysis, I tend to prefer R as well. And there's also certain things uh, specifically in certain machine learning models uh, that R has that Python cannot, uh, can, doesn't have outside of the, uh, right out of the box. You can't go to sklearn for it. You actually have to basically write it yourself. And whereas R, I could just simply import it. So that being said, um, if you already have Jupyter Notebook installed, uh, then uh, you can, if you run into an error in importing any of this, you could do nothing. You could simply just do a Linux command here of uh, pip install and then the, the, uh, the package type. And most likely the one that you will actually uh, need that's not right out of the uh, built right out of the box is NLTK. This actually will install very quickly because what this will do is install the API package. And then the API package itself will allow you to actually if you follow kind of the instructions here. You can actually, once you do in, an import NLTK, you could just do an NLTK download all of it's a one time thing. It'll take about 15 minutes, just a heads up. And if your machine is uh, kind of on the older end, uh, this may not be the best because of the fact that it will first load a lot of things into memory and then install them all one by one. Uh, and then if that's the case, uh, you will actually want to install each uh, individual uh, library one at a time, but you could give it a try first. So uh, you can basically follow the steps here, right? NLTK.download, all you can simply run that in your command line. So, you're some, so you'll have something that looks like this. Okay. But you don't need um, this, uh, you know, to kind of do every single step that we're doing here. You don't need to open this file and then walk through it line by line. It might make it, it'll, it should make it a little bit more fun, a little bit more interactive because you're obviously able to see the live results and you're able to test a few things. But uh, I would like to pause in more of uh, this talk about just the concept of how we can um, look at text without necessarily going into uh, just all the, all the using uh, models or uh, predictive uh, algorithms or uh, forbid like some sort of black box architecture like neural nets, uh, commonly what some of the more popular ones like for example, CNN, RNNs, or using uh, more, uh, I would say, uh, uh, or what I would call a predictive based word embeddings. So for example, if you heard about uh, doc to vec, word to vec and the like, uh, where you're using pre-trained neural nets to basically generate some sort of latent features from your text. So rather than kind of jumping to those steps, I would argue that there's actually a lot of uh, things you can do beforehand with your text data that often is a rinse and repeat when you, uh, before you are able to move forward with the text data in some way that allows it to be suitable for say predictive modeling or so forth, okay? So uh, hopefully you will be able to, even if you don't know Python, you will be able to kind of gain some of the uh, insights on the steps that we choose to do. So I myself, uh, I am a pet person. Uh, I have a uh, lovely black cat. I don't know, she's in the background right now, but I, I think she uh, absconded herself away into the, uh, the bedroom. Uh, but uh, so as a result, um, I chose to kind of use a uh, very popular open source data set from, Amaz uh, from Amazon sales and specifically their reviews on pet supplies. So you could grab this uh, from from uh, our AWS uh, hosted bucket. And you can see here where, now here I'm trying to introduce, uh, I, I wrote it in this way because I wanted to also introduce uh, our students in the program to uh, certain data structures uh, that, or rather data schemas that they may not uh, necessarily see in just a, you know, in their date, uh, in their classroom environment, uh, traditional classroom environment rather, but they will see in the real world, which is some sort of request or API request that you make. And then as a result from that request, you get some sort of data format that is com 
and the most common one would be a JSON file. And then what you should be used to in terms of just loading JSON data and how to uh, pro process it accordingly. It's actually, and in, it's actually quite simple. Uh, you can do similar things in other programming languages. R, for example, does have similar uh, analogs to this as well. Uh, and what we do here is we're using uh, a, a few libraries, specifically here, uh, ul lib, uh, url lib dot request. Um, I actually don't know why I imported request. I think I used it uh, for something else and then I deleted it in this notebook. So, and from there, uh, we will use a, a method that uh, basically just points to where this data is located from. So uh, I actually, when I said uh, I wanted to introduce students to API keys, I think I did originally, but then I removed it because that's where my request line is coming from. But we're kind of skipping that process, but we're making still a request. So making a request from a server to get their data, and then this data comes in a JSON format, which is very common when you actually extract, uh, make a request for data. And from there, uh, you'll take a, you'll see that this is the standard JSON format and what it should be for those of you who've been programming for a while, hopefully uh, you will be able to respond with uh, what kind of data format this reminds you of, just simply uh, data structure rather, rem this reminds you of, uh, simply just type it in the chat. I'd like to, see, you know, I just wanna see uh, how many folks like what level of, uh, of uh, study, your data science studies are you at? So feel free to just type it in chat uh, on what this data structure reminds you of. Yeah, it is a JSON, specifically good. Yeah, a lot of you nailed it. Um, so it is a list, but specifically it's a list of uh, dictionaries. Yes, good. So a lot of you spotted uh, that what you see, and so what you see here, and this is the traditional way that uh, a JSON file is going to be uh, look like, or data JSON data schema is going to look like, which is basically this uh, way, uh, a form of a nested dictionary of sort. And then from there, the dictionary will also have relevant information stored within each uh, each specific uh, label and or key accordingly. Uh, and the nice thing is, once you recognize that it's a JSON format, um, there's actually already a, uh, an easy function in, in built into Pandas that you can uh, load the file into. So we simply just do a read JSON, and then we uh, you want to insert this lines equal to true because uh, if we're parsing more than one block of data, which is usually going to be the case, uh, lines equals true tends to be the flag that you're going to want to do. And then what you do once you do that, it, this will take a little while. Uh, you'll see that the data will come in, uh, will now look like your traditional nice little CSV that's imported into a data frame, right, from pandas or R accordingly, like might be a tibble or a table, depending on which uh, R tools you choose to use. Uh, so this is a much more now familiar and friendly uh, format that we're looking at here. And you can see here in terms of the data, it's uh, really nice for text analysis or other types of analysis you wish to do. This is actually a very nice data set just to do some uh, perform, perform some sort of sales and, or e-commerce anal uh, analytics, which is a pretty big uh, field in terms of data, uh, data science. Yes, so the Jupyter Notebook itself, you, and, uh, you could grab from here, from this GitHub, okay? So you could just download everything from there. So, okay, so from here, we can see a few things, uh, like for example, we have this overall rating, we have also this kind of helpful uh, uh, meter here, as well as reviewer name, uh, and so, uh, also we have timestamps here that can be used and so forth, all right? But because this is a, you know, we're prime, uh, this is an intro to text mining, we're gonna primarily be interested in looking at what we could do with the text features of this data set. Uh, so uh, in addition to just examining ahead, a common thing to do is just a random sampling of your data. So this way, like some, uh, usually what I do is if I look at, uh, if I choose to look at the head, it's usually to identify whether or not there's some sort of aberrant behavior. And what I mean by that is sometimes depending on when you load the file in this, uh, the, the schema of the file, sometimes you'll end up getting things like a blank, uh, blank space in your first row or what may have you, or you might have some descriptive information in your first row and could throw off the formatting of your data once it's read in. And the head is a nice way to kind of check to, like uh, your data set to make sure that there's no additional cleaning process that you may have to do based upon like what's behavior of the head and the tail. If I want to actually get a better sense of what my data really looks like, I tend to use sample because it will just be a random sample of certain uh, of up to a certain amount where you just feed in here about the data itself. 
Okay. So we already see here that uh, in our within our data set, there are some interesting things. For example, we already note that sometimes we'll get the name and other instances will get uh, this consumer tag. And this consumer tag essentially is um, uh, from my uh, recollection, I think it's some sort of default generated name. So you can think of it almost like the equivalent of anonymous in some aspects, right? So I may be interested in uh, how many, um, you know, how many, what percentage of the folks who are in my data set or uh, within our customer database is choosing to leave their feedback anonymously. And the reason why I may want to do that is because one thing that you may want to choose to do is to examine, okay, is there, if they're choosing to leave their, uh, their info anonymously or their feedback anonymously, is the behavior of the reviews that is being left anonymously going to be different than the type of reviews that are left not you know with their name and if the answer is yes in some way that it could be very obvious i may just choose to be able to skip a lot of steps simply because i already observed some sort of variance that is interesting and i may choose to scrutinize one one aspect of that one way or another so what would i want to do one thing i will want to do is to basically extract whether or not this uh, kind of tag here that in some way can hint at anonymity uh, and see if I can just simply filter down to the amount of uh, information that's given here. So there's a few ways to do that. One of the more common ways is to simply just do this string uh, from uh, what I do is you subset the column itself of interest that contains the character you want, you're interested in. And in Python, what, I, what, we, uh, what we do here is basically we say, we want to look at this, what's called a panda series or this column, right? This column vector, I'll try to use some, because I observe some uh, R practitioners here, I'll try to use a term that's familiar to both languages. So we look at this vector and from this vector, we have a few uh, uh, attributes and properties that allow other functions. So specifically here uh, from the STR, basically saying the string, using a string sort of uh, attribute the string attribute would have some sort of method or function you can think of. Uh, and this function, what it says is it contains, it's a contains, it's uh, the contains, it's technically a method, but I'll, in the, in today's session, I'll just use the method and function interchangeably uh, just to make it a more kind of bilingual friendly. Uh, so this, uh, we can think of it as this contains function. And what this function takes is an input of the text that you are interested in of kind of observing whether it, it's a, it occurs or doesn't occur. So this will give you some sort of true and false, okay? And what I will do with this is basically I will then, uh, what I say over here is I am going to do the equivalent of R's fancy indexing or what's built into pandas. And nice thing about pandas is pandas is actually going to behave very similar to R in the first place because that's actually the inspiration of pandas uh, where pandas is drawn from. And Wes McKinney, the author of pandas was pretty open about it. He's basically just was like, yeah, I looked at what R did. I look at what NumPy can do. And I try to create this tools that can replicate R's data analytics tools from, uh, yes, exactly, Kamiko, yeah. Uh, replicate these data analytics tool that already has built up a box. So you'll notice that it gives us this error, but the nice thing about, um, about programming is that often they tell you what the errors, uh, kind of what's the issue they're having. And here it's basically just saying, okay, uh, we cannot do generate these trues and falses because we don't know what to do with these NAs. So here I'm going to take a bit of a shortcut and just introduce an additional flag. And where if you choose to use this function, you could basically say NA equals false. And that will then obviously just simply just uh, ignore the NAs accordingly. So we do that flag. And now we are able to simply just examine what sort of uh, what happens with uh, you know, what if we subset down to the data frame that only has uh, the word consumer in the reviewer name, what's uh, occurring? And we see here now we're down to 156 rows originally from uh, over 157,000. So quite a small percentage, like right, less, way less than 1% even. And, uh, and on top of that, we also behave, be, uh, notice that uh, unfortunately it's not always anonymous. This isn't always a, a key of being anonymous because there are certain people who choose to nickname themselves consumer something something, right? So you see here, this uh, consume uh, this consumer is uh, kind of choosing to use this name, and then similarly here you have this. Uh, uh, I think D probably might be a, even a typo, maybe intends to be doctor, Doctor Chow. 
the savvy consumer. Uh, so uh, it unfortunately did not make our life that much easier. And we can recognize that uh, maybe there's something else going on in terms of uh, how to identify you know, whether somebody is leaving their remark uh, anonymously or not, especially because, for example, it's something like typical consumer AGN. This looks like another name because we can observe that the reviewer ID is the same equivalent uh, here. So there's also other things you can do uh, generally with uh, text data. For example, what I can do here is I can say, OK, um, if we look at the uh, the ratings overall, I can examine, well, if I want to treat this as essentially an R like a factor or a categorical variable. So in other words, um, uh, it's not quite text, uh, but like a categorical label, that will be like a, a one single text feature, a single uh, token. Right. What we can do is we could basically say, OK, we will convert these into a string and the string will essentially act like a factor in R. Uh, and then from there on, a common thing when examining any sort of categorical label, which can be a text, which can be text label, can be an integer level label, for example, from a rating from one to five, or it could say something like one star, two star, three stars, or it could be you might see text that says, OK, uh, poor, fair, good, uh, excellent, and so forth. If you observe that, the way uh, you could quickly generate uh, just the breakdown of that distribution is to simply do a value counts, okay? And the value counts, if we look at what, uh, what it will look like, so I'll show you um, two ways to kind of like handle this. So, show this as a, also just subsetting it as a, uh, as a series, same, so this part, so this way of writing, uh, this getting, extracting the series and this way of extracting the series are equivalent. Um, there's some behavior underneath the hood, but I'm not gonna get into it. Uh, that makes a, a minor difference. But uh, here we can see the value counts basically will just give us exactly the counts of those respective levels. And uh, from there, if we just simply just do a plot, uh, you can make a standard, traditional way of analyzing categorical distribution of some sort, which is a bar plot. Okay. Uh, so, um, and you can also, because of this, in this instance, there is levels, uh, you can make an argument that, well, maybe a histogram would be interesting to examine, but I would say, or I would argue a histogram may not be a traditional uh, in this uh, when analyzing levels. Uh, why do you need the as type string? So the reason why is because uh, we are making a bar plot and the bar plot right now, the, this var value is an integer. And if as an integer, Python will actually treat it as continuous underneath the hood. And then the value counts, if you look uh, right here, it's okay, it should be okay. But if we plot it, sometimes what occurs is, the, oh, in this instance, it was okay. But sometimes what ends up happening is, um, uh, if your uh, if your labels are levels rather are not um, if these integers are not spread from one two three four five like this wasn't a great example but let's say it was something like uh, it says something like one three four five six and you did a bar plot what ends up happening is it will automatically fill in this two because it sees integers as your uh, as your level so doing it this way is just basically being a little bit more uh, robust in terms of handling uh, that potential, uh, you know, inconsistency, right? Because if for whatever reason, uh, you know, your levels do read in a way that it's not, even though it says one, three, four, five, six, so it skips two, it's not intended to be continuous in that aspect. The bar plot uh, actually would end up still treating it as continuous because it sees the integers part. So that's basically it, yeah, good question. So um, now that we kind of observe uh, that, okay, well, from the, um, the reviews, it looks like there's a lot of five-star reviews. So, uh, and that kind of makes sense. When, uh, when you are dealing with uh, uh, e-commerce data and you have review data, or you're dealing with any sort of review data, one thing you always need to be aware of, aware of is this, uh, this user tendency to have uh, predominantly uh, a certain skew that is um, that you have to address in some form. Usually what happens is people uh, who 
because people who submit reviews, they tend to be some sort of form of natural biases. And you tend to really, really see this with actually Yelp data, which is another very common data uh, kind of API or data source that people draw, um, draw from when they're practicing te uh, text mining for the first in the first place. Text analytics be used for credit card merchant data. Um, I don't, I have not worked with credit card merchant data. I kind of like, I've seen it a few times um, just in passing uh, when, for example, maybe like one of my, part, uh, one of our team members are working on something like that, a student working on something like that. Um, but I would, I would be tended towards no uh, usually credit card merchant data, it, 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 I think it's hard. I, I don't have a right, good answer on the spot, unfortunately, because credit card merchant data, usually you tend to evaluate it for some sort of anomaly pattern. And that's even though anomaly uh, detection is actually something that can occur and you can use NLP to solve it, uh, depending on where or how it occurs and so forth. I don't know if credit card merchant data uh, typically has uh, has that uh, has that need. And funny, interesting enough, now that you mention it, I do recall there was a team I had to uh, I participated in their training. Uh, it was with a very large bank, and one of the tasks they looked to do was to work with uh, detecting fraud uh, based on uh, behavioral patterns. And I don't, I would, I don't believe there was any. Um, there was any text analytics involved in that specific task. So well, unfortunately, I can't uh, say yes or no either way because, you know, as a st statistician, it's very hard for me to say 100% yes and no, <laughs> especially in this regard. Okay, so we look at this scenario and we, like I said, um, you tend to, when we come to review data, it tends to be very uh, heavily opinionated. And because of that, um, you tend to see a lot of folks either like rate things, review things very highly or very low, and you don't usually see some sort of middle ground. Now, what's interesting here is we actually observe that there actually does seem to be some sort of uh, trend with the behavior that's go or with the review that's occurring here in that there is, a, like generally speaking, it's safe to say most people who purchase the products that is within this data set uh, seems to be very pleased with it. Uh, because if you look at this uh, distribution, uh, we actually observe that this, uh, what's most telling to me is that of course there's the native, there's the expected behavior, which is a lot of fives, a lot of fours. But what's actually a little bit striking to me would be the fact that there is more threes than ones, which tends to be a little unusual when it comes to dealing with review data. Because review data, I, you will tend to see a lot of fives, a lot of fours, and arguably sometimes even more fours than fives, and then a fair amount of ones. And then the, the kind of the, the middle, the vat where the valley forms is actually around the threes and the twos. Because usually if people have kind of like a more of an average experience, they're less prone to kind of talk about it or post about it. And it just doesn't, you know, it's not very memorable to them, okay? So uh, as a result, what I'm interested in first is I want to just maybe decide, okay, let's just make it easy. We have a lot of data that's actually in the fives. Let's just take a look at what seems to be common trend of things to being discussed uh, in the five ratings. So what would I do? Now here we will do a little bit of a common, uh, uh, common method uh, when dealing with, when analyzing text, which is uh, we want to examine the, we want to examine the overall behavior of, of the text data that we have access to. So what we would do is if we want to analyze kind of like individual records or individual tokens within the text data, we would join them all into uh, what's known as a corpus. And a corpus is uh, a linguistics term. It basically means any form of text intended for a statistical study of some sort. So what we do is we actually take all the review data and we just merge them into a singular document, okay? And document, once again, is another term that's specific to NLP or text analysis, uh, which basically refers to, it's like a single sample, okay? So what, that's essentially what we do here and we basically join them all here. And then what we do is we also lowercase every single term within this uh, document. 
And now this lowercase thing, depending on the, um, the, the task you're looking to do, it can actually uh, you know, affect things. For example, you, you may choose to say that, okay, if uh, certain terms are uppercase versus lowercase, uh, that actually designates uh, a certain type of meaning, a different meaning. Now that's certainly true, but I would argue that the tradition, the reason why we actually do this very commonly when working with text data is because when dealing with text data, you're often dealing with so many different terms that, and the term usually when we talk about NLP is referred to, we refer to them as tokens, but I'm just gonna use some friendlier language right now. So the terms uh, are, you're going to deal with so many different terms that uh, it, the extra noise you induce by lowering doesn't actually affect the signal that is uh, that the you're able to extract from the text. Now, if you actually are interested in examining whether or not an uppercase term and versus a lowercase term has some sort of effect to signify that there is a difference, that is actually its own domain of uh, NLP referred to specifically as uh, named entity recognition. Uh, and you can look into that topic uh, for further studies, but that's definitely outside the scope of uh, today's uh, talk. So just give, simply give me the rationale behind why this is very common instead. And now we're going to uh, look at our first uh, few, uh, essentially uh, libraries that are, that we're drawing outside of just pure Python, uh, traditional Python libraries. Uh, and these are just some easy tools that you can have access to from NLTK uh, as, well, as well as the string, uh, which is built into Python uh, module. So, and from these tools, we can actually do quite a few things uh, that are, uh, that could give us some immediate insights. Uh, now, one thing we want to do is just unify our, our terms. Uh, and I'm going to use uh, uh, here the word uh, uh, lemmatization, uh, a word lemmat lemmatizer. Uh, I'm not going to get too in depth into it, but basically what we're doing, trying to do is anytime you see the stem, it's, uh, and whatever tool you use for stemming, it's in some way basically unifying related word, uh, terms. And what I mean by related terms is terms that have all the same word root of some form. So there is stemming and lemmatization that's often involved. Uh, so don't worry too much about this part, uh, for, uh, but basically we're gonna use that. And, uh, and from this, I'm going to create this uh, object. And basically this object's like kind of like another tool. And I'm gonna use this tool to basically use a function of this tool to return every single word I sip through and filter through into back into its word root, okay? Uh, but before I do that, I actually want to do something else. I want to actually, I, I have so many tokens uh, that's going to occur within my document here. There's gonna be so many unique words. And um, just to not only save processing costs of going through this data set and transforming and analyzing every individual term, but also the fact that there's likely a lot of not, terms there that are in the English language that really did not add any analytical value. We refer to those specifically as stop words. So I'm actually going to uh, grab a list of those stop words from the stop words that words that English basically means it's a list of all English stop words. And then on top of that, I'm also going to add in a list. Uh, I'm going to add to this list uh, uh, all the conventional punctuations. Okay, and the conventional English punctuations is from string dot punctuation. I'm gonna add them all in. And then basically I'm gonna say, if you're found within this list, I want you to get out. I don't want you to, in my uh, final list. And that's basically what, uh, what this whole part, what this uh, line here is doing, token and word tokenized. If the tokens are not in my filters, then I will lemmatize them. And I'm gonna join this back into, it's gonna take a little while, so I'll run this while I'm talking. I'm gonna join this back into a list, okay? And I'm gonna have this gigantic list. And why is this gonna take a while? Because at, even after the filtering step, it still t does a fairly uh, computationally extensive, essentially lookup matching word by word. Uh, yes, it's, uh, it's actually uh, built in from uh, Python. This is a Python module string, so you can grab it from there. You don't need to install anything from there. Uh, you can simply just import. 
uh, and it's gonna go still go word by word until uh, and for each word it sifts through it tries to find a matching word root and replace it accordingly. So it takes quite a while. Uh, generally, this takes a while. It takes like about a few minutes. And then uh, I should have ran this earlier. Uh, mistakes were made on my side. <laughs> uh, maybe I, I, I'll skip a few of the runnings uh, if that's not needed. But I'll talk about now. Um, oh, whoops. I forgot to, oh, no. I forgot to run that line, too. Is there anything else I forgot to run? This one. Now I have to go back um, because it didn't do the filtering yet. Uh, it didn't spot the filtering there. And now we're going to use is uh, this neat little uh, built-in function from uh, NLTK probability called frequency distribution. And what frequency distribution is going to do is really not, uh, neat is it basically will start storing each of your remaining tokens with a certain count of it. So in some, it, essentially it's going to do this value counts for us. Now you might say, wait, why not just do value counts? Because remember, value counts essentially is going operating through a vector. And uh, a token, I'm sorry, is uh, a token is the same thing as a word, a singular word or term of interest or an element of interest. It's not actually a variable. It's usually going to be a, str it's usually a, um, a, str uh, a string, uh, a, it's string format. It's going to be a string format, but usually one word or more or more words of a within a certain window. And we'll talk about that uh, kind of that window uh, later on. And then, uh, so what, uh, what we are feeding in instead this time is actually a single document. So basically it's like a single gigantic long string where that string is essentially every single word in existence across all our reviews. So as a result, uh, to actually go through, you could write a counting function yourself, but it's quite, uh, it's quite annoying to actually do that. So instead, um, instead you are going to just want, you could just use a uh, frequency distribution. Yeah, so if you uh, also, if you guys are, if you guys see a something not found and you, it says NLTK downloader to obtain it, you could basically just do this. Uh, and then you put in whatever uh, it tells you is not found. So for example, here, you could just simply run this. Now, some of the other ones, uh, some of the ones that you use uh, won't be able to do that. So that's why I said uh, you can actually let this run in the background. And this will install everything from NLTK, uh, but it, it does take a little while. Okay, so you could run this in the background instead. So, okay, uh, and then you can see here, we get now every single term, but not only that, you could specifically filter down to the most common terms of interest now. And uh, among other things you could do with this actually, so which we'll talk about. So from this uh, frequency distributed object, this object that we've created by you, uh, by, from, by this text, okay, by just this line of code. We simply import it, we feed it in this list of words that we're interested in, we feed it in this list of words, and then from there on, this dot co most common function where you introduce, where you actually uh, insert how many most common, up to what most common you're interested in, uh, it will give you those respective frequency counts. And already from here, we can add, observe that, it, well, it makes sense that because we're dealing with pet supplies, the most frequent ones are going to be dog, cat, and because of the rating that we are uh, specifically uh, focused on, there is, but I don't re uh, remember it, Kumiko, off the top of my head, because there is, a, because in R, the equivalent of frequency distribution would be uh, a count, uh, it'll be uh, what's referred to, if I recall correctly, as a count matrix. And the count matrix is actually going to create some, a similar, uh, a similar um, output. Uh, and I know that um, if I recall, TMP uh, has it. Uh, and in fact, I can even maybe just. All right. Uh, uh, well, uh, this is an. Um, it's a T it, it should be TMP. Uh, thing, like, yeah. Text miner. Oh, this is another one. That's right. This is another one. There's a few R ones. The one that I, the traditional one I'm used to is uh, is TMP, but there is additional ones that actually have TMP baseline, and they will actually allow you to do uh, the, these similar tasks. Uh, so good question. Yeah, we're also going to get so. So you also observe here we got some anomalies, right? Uh, this int, this s, and that's usually because of how 
this word tokenize where is it right here how different word tokenizers behave and how basically what word tokenizer does and every single tokenizer is it tries to extract what it thinks of the word based upon what we call a regular expression pattern okay a regular expression pattern is a certain type of pattern about your text that you believe this pattern fulfills it means a word it's a word so what i mean by that is a regular expression pattern could say everything from capital a to z everything from lowercase a to z no spaces in between that would be like a pattern a regular expression pattern and you say i find this pattern and anytime i identify this pattern it is a word so because of the regular expression pattern it uses it may uh, it can end up creating these kind of extra tokens that are not of interest to us now what that brings to the next point so we because we observe these extra tokens it makes sense that we want to get rid of them so what am i going to do i'm going to write this uh extra function then that basically streamlines as my processes for me so that i can actually then feed in extra tokens that i don't want to include within my uh overall analysis later so my next step is to build some sort of programming function and you you don't need to worry too much about the line by line here. Uh, one, because of the sake of time, I'm really behind timing <laughs> already, uh, I recognize. Uh, but also because of the fact that uh, uh, that's, I, I don't want this to be a pure programming class, right? Uh, I want it to be more about how you approach uh, analyzing text. So what would I do? I, because I recognize I am going to repeat this, likely repeat this type of process, it's often useful to build a function that lets you at least not have to repeat uh, by just simply copy and pasting gigantic chunks of code. So I write this function that allows me to generate this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this object for analysis. And uh, with it, I'm going to also include in this extra ability to filter out words of, uh, words of interest, right? Uh, so, or rather words that are, I, I do not find very interesting. So if I were to run this function again, uh, and I should have ran this in advance while I'm still talking, uh, we will be able to see that actually it cleaned up all the things that uh, we don't necessarily need. Uh, so uh, uh, as uh, our faculty team can uh, consult on projects, uh, but uh, you're going to have, we'll, we'll have to take that you know, on the side later. Uh, that's, it's possible. Um, we'll, we'll have to take, evaluate what the project is going to have to be. Um, and also what's the bandwidth uh, on it, re uh, respectively speaking. So one thing to, of interest to note is that when we observe this kind of output, uh, it, it usually signals to me that, um, it's it just from experience, that if I see this type of two, list of what's called tuples, right, this, or this vector of tuples, that this format is likely to be a dictionary. Okay, that's generating this underneath this uh, underneath the hood. And why is that helpful? Because once I recognize that I think this is a dictionary, then it means I can observe and retrieve certain things as if I were using taking advantage of dictionary structure, uh, taking advantage of dictionary data structure. And uh, this, one of the things that I know I can take advantage of when using a dictionary data structure is that they have a key value pair always because that's just the way Python dictionaries behave. And because we have this key value pairing uh, behavior underneath the hood, it means as long as I know any text of interest, any key of interest, I can get back the corresponding value. And in this case, the corresponding value is guaranteed to be the count. So what does that mean? I might be interested in saying, well, how often is the word safe being used? Well, from this object that's storing this in a key value pairing, I could simply just use the word safe now as a key. So I'm basically using the key safe and saying what is the value that is equipped stored to the key safe. And he, we he, see here the value stored is uh, 1998, which is not the, a year. It is saying there is 90, 19, 1,998 occurrences of this term being used. And that might be interesting to me because, for example, I want to know, well, are, because I can say, okay, well, if I look at how often this term is being used across all my samples, I can have a snapshot of saying, well, our customers overly, are, are our customers who are 
reviewing products highly? Are they reviewing highly based upon safe, its safety? Uh, and unfortunately here, it looks like at the very least the reviews is not placing a high priority on safety simply because uh, we have, as you can see here, we are, there are more, you know, just from the given snapshot here, uh, if we look at action after the curation, most of the good reviews are actually more focused on the enjoyment that their pet has on that product instead. And we can see that from just this, an, this quick in analytics, right? And that unfortunately might, you know, play some part in terms of recommendations. Like if I had to, you know, consult with now this uh, pet reviews, I might actually say like, yeah, actually it looks like as long as you find out what pets seem to be most engaged with in terms of their, uh, in terms of their, uh, this product or the, uh, you know, what they seem to enjoy eating, like see, that seems to be the highest priority. So it might not necessarily matter that this pet is getting obese from eating it or whatever, what may have you, right? And, and that's, you know, not necessarily the most ethical thing to suggest, but it, it, there might be some evidence of that now from this actual comparison accordingly, okay? So that's a great question. So yeah, how can I generate, and that's actually literally that in the next thing I'm going to look at, is how, what about, uh, you know, what we refer to as in the industry as bigrams. In other words, two terms that are used in, next to each other. And in some ways, this gives you some sort of context clue as well of what things are being used, how words are being used. But before I go to bigrams, there's actually a totally different uh, kind of individual linguistics topic that this object can also fetch for you. It's called HEP axis. And HEP axis, what it could do is, uh, HEP axis are unique occurrences of a word across your entire thing. So things that only include, uh, are included once or, or mentioned once within your text. So that's also, be, uh, you could just retrieve that from here. So bigrams, how would I be able to grab them? Nice, nice thing is it's nice and easy from NOTK instead of earlier above here where we looked at word tokenize, right? From NOTK, you see here word tokenize, okay? From NOTK, we actually can grab this bigram function NLTK.bigram. And we same the exact thing. You all of these things expect a list of, or not a, uh, not a list, I'm sorry, a, a gigantic string or corpus to be fed in all at once. And it will generate then accordingly uh, from, uh, from this corpus on uh, the token length of interest. And commonly speaking, uh, the, the, you really don't go beyond the window of two. So what I mean by window is, uh, let's say we want to generate uh, my pet really loves uh, food, okay? And I want to generate like a, a window of two tokens. So in other words, what will happen is my pet is a, uh, is one is uh, one of the terms pet really uh, really loves loves food, these will be all our tokens that we generate with a window of two. If I want to extend the window of three, it goes become my pet really, pet really loves, really loves food. And then we're done that there at the window of three. Generally speaking, you don't go to that, uh, to that length um, because uh, it, it causes an issue where it blows up actually what, your feature space and you'll get too many uh, unique, first of all, you'll get too many unique features that are not very going to be very interesting, but it will also hurt uh, your analysis overall. So usually I would say you have to have a very good argument for anything beyond biogram, but they can they do exist. So we look at biograms, you can generate it very easily. And because it's so commonly used, you'll notice it's even a uh, specific feature in uh, NLTK or a specific function. You might wonder where is the uh, function, uh, like where is the unigram function? Where tokenized is actually the unigram equivalent. <laughs> So we look at here, we look at, uh, and we generate these, uh, these bigrams uh, in terms of what's, uh, and I'm gonna run this real quick in the background after I talk about this, because I might end up using this in a bit. Uh, and you can see here, now we're actually gonna get bigrams of dog love, cat, uh, this is wrong, can't, it's just a unigram, cat love. So dog love, cat love, kind of what we suspected earlier, right? It looks like, a majority of actually comments that are driven by these high, you know, by these uh, people who are reviewing with these, five, like putting five star reviews, you're actually just focusing on how much the pet likes it rather than other factors. Like we looked at earlier, 
it didn't look like safety played as big of a factor, at least from just the surface level. Now, there are going to be things, for example, and always in any analysis where you say, well, there should be some sort of latent factor, latent behaviors that are also driving some of these decisions, right? But if at a surface look, you, you can argue that, well, from the surface look itself, it doesn't look like there is. A lot of it seems more focused on the uh, pet's interaction with it or how much they like a food, given food. So I'm going to run this in the background for now. It's going to take a little while. And same exact thing. We can now, if we can use, because we recognize the structure, a key looks in the dictionary, we put the structure in, we put in, uh, I'm one of the brands. So how do I take advantage of this? One of the brands I shop for is called Science Diet. Uh, it's very, uh, I, I don't want to push it. <laughs> That's not what today's talking about. But it does, uh, from at least uh, a lot of what a lot of vets say, it appears to be one of the more higher ranked, healthier pet foods. So I might be interested in, well, how many reviews seem to talk about science diet? And there seems to be some amount of comments that talk about science diet that is weighted very highly. So as a result, once I'm able to kind of look that part up, that information up, I could use what we love, talked about earlier, all the way above. I filter down to the review text that specifically just says science diet within. And this is in this instance, I wanted to make it case sensitive because the reason why I choose to make it case sensitive is because I'm interested in science diet as a product. And I want, and because there's some evidence that, hey, this seems to be talked about, I want to see what people seem to say about science diet as a product. And there are some neat things already that we can observe. From here, we already see that, hey, we have folks who generally speaking rate them fairly high. But what about over here? We got this two, but why did we get a two here? Well, well, if we look at why we've got a two specifically here, you can actually investigate even in greater detail, you'll observe something pretty interesting. Oh, whoops. Oh, it's been 833. Uh, not in this instance, Douglas, because um, very likely folks, uh, my, at least in my hypothesis, my hypothesis here would be that I think more folks who are kind of writing out, uh, you know, uh, dedicated reviews of some sort will try to take care of at least spelling it case sensitive at least once if they mention it in their, uh, <clears throat> in their text if they do. So <clears throat> we can see here, one of the things that actually was a negative review, right? This is linked to uh, review index A33. The overall rating was a two, was actually comparing another product that was purchased instead of science diet. So, uh, and that this product in comparison was worse. So this is important because it, you, you observe that there's two things, one, if you simply just extract text based on and filter down the text based on whether it has a certain feature of interest or not, or a term of interest or not, you might actually, you know, you might not get all the text that are specifically focused on that topic, right? But that, because that term, when we talk about topics, topics are usually observed by the occurrence of terms, whether you talk about topic as in using predictive modeling clustering to create these topics or just observing topics by the eye test. Topics are often created by the observation or occurrences of terms and the distribution of these terms uh, to form some sort of topic that you sus suspect occurs. Uh, and we want to take note that just because this term science diet occurred in this review, it didn't necessarily mean that this review was about science uh, diet as you can see here, right? The two was not associated to that. So we, I might also be interested just because I, uh, I want to look, you know, I want to look at this product a little bit more in depth with we'll see things people like about it. I will specifically just now combine the steps we just talked about, all the stuff we just talked about. I filter down to the ones that are just five star ratings. And then I specifically only look at from there, I only look at the ones that have science diet. Okay, so that's my science diet and specifically only the five-star rating ones. And we look only at those. 
and we look at what seems to be things people are saying, food, diet, science. Now, what we observe already, we know science diet is a food, okay? Or, or I know it's a food brand, right? Uh, or pet food brand. And science and diet, of course, are going to be very common occurrences because of the fact that it's literally the name. So what does that mean? I can plot out some sort of uh, frequency distribution to examine. So what you could do with this object, once again, this nice, uh, this neat uh, S, uh, NLTK object, it has a plot. And the plot can plot up to the X most common terms of what the frequency looks like across uh, those common terms. But I could also make it a bar plot, okay? And I can make it a bar plot by using this most common and creating a pandas data frame object from it. And the pandas data frame object, I can simply just make it so that I uh, automatically set in this tuple, uh, this uh, list tuples, pandas data frame sees this tuple and says, okay, I recognize this list of tuples and I know to automatically construct it into a standard data frame accordingly. And what I can do is I can remove not only food, but we could go a few steps further. We can remove food, diet, and science, because they're the three most uh, frequently occurring. So it's automatically going to be ordered to in frequency in the frequency distribution. It's going to be the three most common. So it's occurring in that aspect. I remove them. I just index it out, them all out. And I say, OK, give, start from the fourth most frequent term. And let me take a look at how that looks. And what it looks like is uh, this kind of uh, might even match up with a little bit of my experience. Look at cat now becomes the most uh, fr frequent term. And this is interesting because I actually have a cat and science diet is what I purchased for the products for the cat. So I don't actually even know if necessarily then uh, what is the dog equivalent or why dog is so much less occurrent than uh, even cat. So I might even examine this further and say like, well, is there a missed market opportunity here? Are, can like, is there a reason why cat owners seem to be more preferential towards science diet than dog owners? And then if I was making some sort of recommendation to science, I, I might look into this for like kind of behavior difference further. You can do the equivalent of some of these tasks using other libraries as well, which is why, like I said, I tr I'm not going to try to go too in depth into the, exactly how the coding works because uh, it's more about what you can do with text data in general. So if you're using R or so or P Python, but you're not using NLTK, you can use with other different tools, right? So you can see here, if we want, we can do the same equivalent thing using sklearn. We can use sklearn's feature extraction for feature extraction. There's a text uh, sort of extraction uh, 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 function or module rather uh, that you can use. And we can get the same exact thing as, uh, as, um, as frequency uh, distribution from NLTK, but you have to do a bit more work. So you have to do these uh, following steps uh, and you could you have essentially, and here we're doing bigrams as well. And now we can get this uh, this list essentially from here. And then what you'll end up having to do is you basically sweep through your text. And for each of these feature names, you will basically get a count. Uh, if you make this into a, uh, if you put this into a data frame object, you end up getting these feature names and uh, you get a count in each sample instead of uh, across each sample each of the feature names that are with the count of each of those terms occurrences. And then if you do a summation across uh, across rows, you of course can get back the feature frequency. So not necessarily something I wanna go jump into, but it is showing you that there is an equivalent way of doing it using other tools as well, okay? And then finally, uh, what, what are some new things? Once again, like I said, you observe that, hey, wait, I am going to potentially do this analysis over and over and over again, once again, build it into a function, right? So I might be interested in applying this form of analysis uh, into my, in, as an aggregate, uh, as a group by aggregate function. And although I might be interested in examining, well, per review, what seems to be occurring. So what can I do? I build it into a function that, that you see here. And then I apply this function to each of the individual groups. Okay, so the so same group by, uh, aggregation that you would do in SQL, R, Python, and so forth. Except this time we're doing a, a nate, uh, you know, by hand created uh, constructive function. And from here, I apply this function. What do I see? I see, okay, yeah, what's going on? I can now see what's going on with like, you know, pet related products. 
for reviews, what they seem to be saying about reviews that are low ratings, reviews that are high ratings, and low ratings, what seems to be a common trend, or common trend tends to be that uh, you look around here, some of the words, is usually because your pet got sick eating something and, you know, it made a mess on, you know, <laughs> on your rug or something and the like. And there also seems to be some sort of trend where the dog products seem to review a little bit lower than, uh, worse than a high product cat product simply because of how the dog, uh, the frequency of dog occurs or words that are related to dog are occur more in the lower reviews than cat. Okay. So those are some things that uh, can be observed. There are some other things you can do. You can look at what context a word is being used in. You can kind of see the following code here. There are some tools that allow you to do it. But the common things that are called is either concordance, and these are just more NLP terms. So there are equivalent libraries in common contexts that you can see here. So major, some takeaways is, as you can see, we really only just scratched the surface of what you can do with text without doing any form of predictive modeling. You can already start identifying what are some patterns, trends, areas where you can spend more time digging into deeper insights for and so forth. So I leave you some questions here as well about, well, how might you be able to answer these questions accordingly then? You looking at, you know, as inspiration of what we have done here. And because here we've only just kind of, what do we manage to do after like, you know, all of this? Usually what happens when I work with text data as a whole, which is after the first hour, all I did was give me more list of questions about hmm, how should I be in some way manipulating the data to allow myself to do another repeat. And you kind of rinse and repeat this at ad infinitum. And uh, I would even tell you, I wish uh, some of uh, the staff members who I have are collaborating on this project uh, kind of kind of also be around and, and they'll even tell you that often when they present certain pieces to me about text data that they're analyzing, I usually say, I think you need to go back and analyze this further after you make these adjustments. <laughs> and that's just very common. It's just one of those things. Okay. Uh, so yeah, Dave, uh, what we call, that's uh, just uh, sub, it's subsetting, but actually the real term is uh, it's Boolean indexing is what I'm actually doing there. Or the R equivalent, there's actually an R equivalent and this formatting of indexing uh, by a certain true and false rule is in R just called fancy indexing. And that's a behavior native to R vectors. Uh, uh, what industries are, do I see text? Um, oof, good question. Uh, so right now, one thing that I could tell you that we're immediately looking at and, you know, from the uh, from a marketing perspective, you know, which is one of the things I work with uh, in terms of this company is, you know, analyzing marketing trends and so forth, uh, is if we want to try to get, understand some sort of consumer sentiment, uh, consumer sentiment text mining is very much needed, obviously. Uh, there are also some, uh, when you're talking about some of the bigger tech firms, there are some common things such as detection of certain things of interest for example, hate speech, sarcasm, uh, bots, like the behavior of uh, text is generated by bots. Uh, so predictive tasks of some form, um, uh, consumer sentiment, predictive tasks. Um, I would say uh, any form of commerce analytics, that also another thing. Uh, there's actually a lot, <laughs> there's a lot of domain, a lot of areas where text mining can be is one of the primary skills that could be needed. Um, so uh, I would probably argue that any instance where you recognize there is some sort of opportunity to either understand uh, information data from text that's useful for your problem, that's going to be obviously be then one of the primary skills then. So industry-wise, there's a lot of different uh, opportunities for sure. Uh, now, for example, there are certain ones where it's not used at all. Like, for example, I remember I had to collaborate uh, in some ways with uh, uh, supply chain, uh, and that was just more about like say time series, uh, uh, data aggregation, um, understanding the model they already use, and analyzing a model based upon that, and so forth. That wouldn't that doesn't have any text involved. So, um, but for example, in kind of more of what I just talked about, where maybe I'm trying to understand consumer sentiment, then text analysis would be.
uh, how would be how it would be possible to generate that in a way? Yeah. Uh, so David, that's uh, that's actually what we uh, what I mentioned by there are ways also of um, you can start once you observe certain tokens, you can start bidding them. And you usually use what you would do is use some sort of probabilistic model where you observe that certain things occur with each other. And as you can probably guess, there are some standard statistical tests you can use, like even just going as far as simple as saying ANOVA tests, right? Does the occurrence of one thing affect the occurrence of another? Uh, to more complex statistical models that you would do, such as what uh, one of the more common ones that's used in the industry is known as um, Ling and like allocation, which is essentially, if you know, if you guys know, uh, are on the stats heads, it's nothing more than a generalized beta distribution, like. Right? And you kind of examine multi uh, multivariate version variants of it. Uh, that sounds very uh, jargony and like it's nothing more than that. I mean, it's more complex. It's quite complex in terms of the calculation and derivation. But the underlying concept is essentially some form of statistical distribution. You believe these these individual like these separate topics are either same different distributions or same distribution. They're the same distribution. They're the same topic. And if they're different distributions, they would be different topics, for example. Uh, in predicting the next word, uh, that's totally different. Uh, <laughs> Kamiko, that's, uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of other stuff that goes on beyond that <laughs> for up to which, uh, up to which gram. Um, that's uh, in its own, own, own game. Uh, specifically speaking for that one, you um, usually they look one word ahead uh, at the baseline, though, uh, but not only do they look one word ahead, they also go one word back as well. That's more common. Is the more common uh, kind of model that does that. And the the in fact, uh, word to vec, uh, the model that Google built, uh, is uh, basically that behavior underneath the hood. It is uh, each specific term is generated. Uh, the representation of that term is generated as a probabilistic estimate of terms that are occurring before it and occurring after it. Uh, so that is um, that is kind of like uh, why I said that that in and by itself is a whole different ball, ballpark and that, not something that uh, you know we can we would have time in a quick discussion to talk about. <laughs> All right, um, so uh, thank you for being a, uh, a very uh, engaged audience. Uh, um, uh, I apologize for also the, uh, the time uh, the delay and also some of the time spent. Hopefully you all found this enjoyable.